Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good morning. On this beautiful autumn day and uh, approaching Thanksgiving, we'll say a little grace. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and thank you for all those who are attending to hear more of our local history. I ask that you be with all of us this day. Bless us. Bless all those in our families and always keep us ever thankful for the many gifts that you've given us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> this, this is our biggest crowd of the, uh, the season. It must be because of our presenter and our, our topic. Uh, the topic today is Lafayette and Brandywine. And as you may know, uh, Lafayette came over from France, joined the Continental Army in his first battle. He was wounded about a mile from here, uh, over on called Birmingham Road. Uh, Bruce Moday doesn't need much of an introduction. He's spoken by several times on uh, the Johnston Gang, the Wyatt Art Theft, the former uh, newspaper reporter and editor, and author of numerous books, which I'm sure all of you will be buying at the table in the back afterward. So without any further ado, Bruce. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. That's great. I guess I should stand here for the uh, Zoom people. Yeah, right there is a good spot. Is that a good spot? Yep. Okay. Thank you for helping uh, inviting me back. I think it's uh, about the third or fourth time, David, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it's always a pleasure to come back. So thank you for inviting me. And we're going to talk today about my latest book, just released uh, officially right at Halloween. Um, so it's a brand new book. It took about three or four years to research. And I was having a couple of discussions earlier today and I had in the past. A lot of people said, you know, I know Lafayette's name a little bit, but not really what he did. And I was pretty much the same way when I started. But I, I got to tell you, you know, this man's life and what he did for the freedom here it's just, it's just amazing. I, you can't imagine somebody taking on, you know, what he did to help us and spending his family fortune. And then later what happened to him in France when he was in prison during the French Revolution. It's just an amazing story. Um, I received a comment from, from the publisher, actually the book designer. And she said, you know, when I finished this project, I just fell in love with Lafayette, and, and you know, just as what he did it was just amazing. How this book started um, years ago, I did a book on the Battle of the Brandywine. It was the first book really to take a full length look at the battle down here on September 11th, 1777. And you know, by all accounts, it was a major defeat for George Washington, our forces, the, the British officers that said, that wrote that if they had another couple hours of daylight, George Washington's army wouldn't exist, wouldn't exist. It. Since there wasn't anything written, I thought, wow, you know, I really need to do a book that's just said, write it. And, and I tell people with my books, they don't, you know, tell me to write them. It's not, I go out and do the books. I'm really kind of inspired by the subject. And as I was going through the, you know, the Battle of the Brandywine, I thought there had to be something that was really important for us in reading or winning our freedom. And everybody down at the park said, you know, the American soldiers stood up to the British, the vaunted British, the best army in the world, for, for some time up on um, Sandy Hollow. And they took that thought of the, you know, standing toe to toe back to Valley Forge. They became better soldiers and beat the British. And I thought, yeah, it sounds good. And I, I had it in the book and I talked to several, several people, but it just kind of gnawed at me. Was that really true? You know, you kind of think about it, you know, uh, this was a major defeat. If something was going to spot and inspire you, you would think Saratoga, major victory would have been better than, than the defeat of Brandywine. You know, did they really take that thought back to Valley Forge? 
you know, they didn't even get the Valley Forge to three months after the Battle of Brandywine. They didn't really start the big drills that got them better soldiers until, you know, a couple months later. I really think Van Steuben had a lot more to do with it than a couple of hours of Brandywine. You know, and if you're going to remember a defeat, you had the Battle of the Paoli, which was a couple you know, weeks after Brandywine, and, and supposedly the first battle cry, remember Paoli, came out of there. You know, did that really, did those couple hours up on at Sandy Hollow really was that inspirational? Or was it just us trying to figure out something good that happened? And the more I thought about it, I said, you know, I'm not quite buying this. But there must have been something at Brandywine. And my thought came back to Lafayette time and time and time again. Again, there was that draw, you know, Lafayette and Brandywine. I started doing some research and I found out we almost chased Lafayette away back to France, even before Brandywine. I said, how much different that would have been if the Continental Congress, uh, if we followed Continental Congress and went back to France a couple, you know, a month before the Battle of Brandywine. I'll tell you how that happened. And, you know, then you can kind of look at the, how we want our freedom. And we couldn't have done it without the French. The French, especially that French Navy down at Yorktown, chased away the, you know, the, the British fleet and gave Washington a chance, and Lafayette. Lafayette was one of the main players in Yorktown. The surround Cornwallis, the defeat that eventually led to the, the treaty and our freedom. So you, you take a look at that, and then I started to see how influential Lafayette was in securing the French aid and keeping the French on our side. And it was touch and go many different times. There was always Lafayette there, there, and there. So I'm thinking, you know, he was an American hero. And, and we'll talk a little bit later about his travels to uh, the United States, where he was a guest of the nation, the nation's guest for 13 months and feeded almost daily with, you know, with banquets and parades and, and all kind of formal circumstances, including one that took place just down the road in Westchester at the end of July of 1825. So how did he come here? He was, you know, such a hero. You know, how did it all take place? And then I kind of put a little bit more together and I said where it all started was really up here at Brandywine when he was wounded. And he shed his blood and people understood that he was really serious about helping us. That's what was the main importance of the Battle of Brandywine. And also, that's where Lafayette got started with American Hero. Early on in my research, I, I hooked up with American friends of Lafayette. And I was talking to them and I was telling them about my theory. And, and they almost laughed. They said, we could have told you Lafayette was the story of Brandywine. Nobody down there would listen to us. <laughs> and, and, that, that, and they were absolutely uh, true about that. American Friends, great organization. Actually, they invited me to Yorktown uh, for part of the celebration in, in the middle of October. There's always backstories with the books and, and the little uh, bit of, I guess, stress came when this, I was supposed to have my copies of the book on October the 7th. They had the celebration on October 19th which is the anniversary of this uh, surrender. And all of a sudden the publisher says, we're not sure we're gonna have the books in time. I said, yeah, you know, I promise. I didn't tell the people at American Friends, but uh, they worked with the publisher and they were really great. And I actually got them like two days before I left to go to Yorktown. So, so it all worked out. But, you know, this all kind of came together. Um, there was a big celebration a couple years ago at Sandy Hollow with the reenactment and a guy who portrayed Ben Frank, or you know, Lafayette was there across the way. And, and Ben Ben's his first name. And I got to talk with Ben, and I ran across my theory that really Brandywine was the place it all started. And he agreed. And I talked with some other people who've done long uh, biographies of Lafayette. And I said, yep, that, you know, that kind of fits. 
And so I started to really research my book. There's so much about his life that I didn't want to do a biography. Because if you really did justice, you know, it would be about that uh, big. There was a new one actually just came out, dealt with a lot of his uh, time in France. But I really wanted to hone in on what he did for us, how he got here, you know, a little bit about the background and, and what made him that American hero. So I kind of launched into the research. The background on him, he, he, he was one of the most wealthiest persons in France. He was, his father died when he was two years old at the Battle of Minden, uh, a British, you know, France was fighting British in the Seven Years of War, an artillery unit of the British were responsible for his father's death. A Lafayette knew that from a fellow officer for his dad. They knew which unit fired the, the uh, artillery shell. And during the Virginia campaign here, actually the, the commander of that artillery unit was in France, it was in Virginia too, and Lafayette really wanted to avenge his father's death. Um, it looked like they were gonna clash together, but the British officer died of a fever right before the, the battle took place. So you have Lafayette from a you know, well-known, wealthy family. His mother also died fairly young. He, he was brought, brought up by his mother, his grandmother, very much a lot of female influences in his, you know, uh, in his family. You could see that later. And, and for whatever reason, he you know, really developed an interest that everybody should be treated the same and free and equal. And that's how it really came to embrace the American cause. Uh, as was the custom in the times back then, he, there was an arranged marriage because when his mother died, he was really wealthy and one of the noble um, families decided he'd be a great catch. And uh, for a couple of years, his wife didn't know she was to become Lafayette's husband. And frankly, her mother wasn't sure if Lafayette was the right person, but it's amazing how it all worked out, how much they, they really loved each other as they went forward uh, in, in their lives. The Lafayette became a musketeer. He had uh, somebody, his father-in-law helped him get a French uh, officer's commission. Even though he was in the French army, he never really fought over there. Uh, and after the loss to Great Britain, the French army was downsized and, and he really lost his spot in the army. But he, he was still in it when he met some of, of Masons and also the King of England's brother came over uh, to tour after the war was over and he, he was talking about the war and the colonies and, and Lafayette really got inspired to go and take part in the, this war. By this point, he's married, he has a young son, his wife's a teenager, he's only 19 and he decides, I am going to go. I'm going to go to America and I'm going to help these, uh, this country become free. So he talks with some of his musketeers and they decided to keep it quiet. They, they talked with some of the Americans over here and he, got a, he was promised a commission in the American army and he starts to make plans to come over. The problem was the king did not want him to do so. His father-in-law didn't want him to do so. Not that they, France was against us getting our freedom, but France had just lost the war. They weren't strong enough to take on England in another war. And they didn't want a, you know, a very visible nobleman to be out there helping uh, the American cause. So they said, don't go. Lafayette was not deterred. He met uh, some of the Americans and some of the other French officers who were willing to come over with him. Uh, and you know, they got together and he started uh, plans to come over. The king found out a couple of his, his uh, 
cohorts decided not to come, but he persevered. And he bought his own ship for the ship for the trip over. As he was doing this, the king found out, and the king actually sent some of his his guards out to arrest Lafayette. So Lafayette actually had to escape France even to get here. He finally goes and gets on and, and he gets on the, the boat and he's coming over and he starts to learn a little bit about English. He took books where he uh, studied military command because he was supposed to be a general. Again, he's never been in war himself. And he then had the idea that maybe I should tell my wife that I uh, left. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so he writes this long letter back to her, and uh, it's, it's a great letter, and you can tell he's having second thoughts. And, and so he's doing the research, and a lot of this book, I, 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 a lot of the, the information came from his own memoirs that he had published along with his family, and um, they're available on some of the university sites. So. I had a really good copy of it and gone through, and they're, they're written in you know, that tone and with all the words and flowers. And you know, I think if you do too much of the quoting of that, it really stops to read. So I tried to paraphrase, give, keep the context when I'm doing it. But I, I quoted at this letter at length because you, you really have to read it to see the. What he's asking, he, you know, about 14 different times he's asked for forgiveness. You still love me? Let me tell you why I did this. You know, it's a noble cause. And, he, you know, as he's on that ship, he was not sure what his reception was going to be when he returned to France. Was his wife going to kick him out? Was, you know, the king going to put him in irons in the Bastille? He had no idea as he was coming over. And he didn't know until he got back because, as you can think about the communications, um, you know, it wasn't easy to send a letter over and get it delivered as he's going around with Washington's army. So he spent the whole time kind of thinking, can I be there? He uh, lands in uh, South Carolina. One of the other officers was a guy named Dekel. And of course, you go to King of Prussia, you can go on to Cal Street, or I don't know what it is. It's named after the general. The Calb um, was a Prussian, but spent most of time in France. He, he knew English because he was over here during the uh, French and Indian Wars, and he helped Lafayette a little bit with the English, and they started their trek from South Carolina up to Philadelphia. Lafayette just fell in love with the United States, even it seemed like before he jumped off the ship into South Carolina, he was writing these letters back, you know, this is a wonderful you know, country, everybody loves each other, and, you know, it's, it's just exactly what he wanted. A little bit rose-colored glasses, as we know, because, he, you know, you got the slavery going on, you got the American Indians here, and, but he, he was, you know, just really thrilled with being here and what he saw. He bought uh, some carriages and things and started the trip. Lafayette spent a lot of his fortune on the United States. He, you know, besides this, he bought uniforms and guns and, and bankroll things and, and just spent, spent, spent here. And he was a volunteer. He didn't ask for any, any pay. Bad trip all the way up. Um, you know, the carriages, of course, broke within you know, a few miles because they weren't made for the back rooms of traveling up to Philadelphia. He gets to Philadelphia. He, he's there, and he knocks on the door finally at the end of July 1777 and says, here I am. I'm ready to become a general. He was told to go home. He was told to go home because George Washington had enough of the political general. He said, you know, they cost us a lot of money. They, um, you know, weren't, they couldn't raise any troops. They didn't know the language. Um, I have 
American born generals and or generals have been with us since the beginning of the war. And you know, now you're gonna have these European generals outside out rank my fighting generals. We don't need them, no more. So that's why the Congress said go away. And, and sure enough, the cab was ready to go home and a couple of the others, but Lafayette persisted and kept coming back and saying, you know, here I am, you promised me. And he got some support from Ben Franklin and a few others saying, you're nuts, get him in the army. You know, he's well respected in France. We need France as an ally. And he has a lot of money. So, you know, don't be money in the way. Uh, eventually the Congress said, yeah, we can do this. And they talked with Washington. And Washington was sort of talked into it with the idea that Lafayette would be an honorary kind of general and he really wouldn't have charge of any troops. It was like, stand over there, little boy, you know, throwing your uniform, everything's okay. And he was 19 at this point. He, so Lafayette goes out and buys his uniform and makes it really plain to Washington, I'm here to fight. And I'm going to put me, you know, in a little corner. And uh, Washington didn't know what to do it with him. He, he actually wrote back to Congress and, and contacted a couple of people he knew from Virginia saying, what am I to do with him? And they probably, they, what they basically said was, he's your problem, you take care of him. <laughs> this was be right before the Battle of the Brandywine in August, and of course, Battle of Brandywine was September 11th, 1777. There was a bond that started to really be built between Washington and Lafayette. Uh, a lot of people describe it as a father-son relationship. It was probably pretty close, and later on, Lafayette himself uh, named his son after uh, George Washington. Lafayette was not overly impressed with the U.S. Army at that, uh, Washington's Army at that point. You can imagine, you know, they didn't have uniforms, they weren't really thrilled, they, you know, the presentation wasn't great, but they had a lot of spirit. The British were on the move at that point. Washington knew that General Howe had a lot of his men, and William Howe, the Admiral, had a Fast armada, they were going someplace. They didn't know if they were going north to help Burgoyne's army. They didn't know if they were going further south to come up or to attack Philadelphia. Of course, Philadelphia was, was the target. And when Washington finally figured out that they were coming up the Chesapeake uh, River, the base of the Americans moved to Wilmington and further down, and, and Lafayette is out where he's working with. with uh, Washington, at one point, right after the British landed, Lafayette was <clears throat> didn't think that little search party with Washington was a good idea and, and could have easily been captured, but they weren't. Um, and so they kind of maneuvered, and Washington decides, we've got to fight. we got to protect Philadelphia. Not that he wanted to, because he knew the British Army was much bigger and better uniformed and better, you know, just a better army than his. He wanted to continue kind of the sniping hit and run tech, but Congress wanted to be defended and the countries in Europe, in Europe that might come to their aid, including France and Spain, expected a defense to be put up and that we could just not hand over our national, uh, our nation's capital there. The, uh, while they were out, uh, Lafayette turned 20. Uh, there's a great historical place called the Hell Burns House outside of Newark. And, and that's where he had his 20th birthday celebration, just a couple days before the Battle of Brandywine. Lafayette uh, was with Washington on Washington's staff as Washington decided to take the Brandywine River as a defensive point. And what he all he wanted was to for Howe's British Army just to charge across the Brandywine, and he thought he could have big enough, strong enough defensive positions to hold them off. Um, when I was doing the book on the Battle of Brandywine, I was always told of some local, I mean, it was some local people who told Washington just protect the fords up to just short of 
Lenape and the British would spend days trying to get around them, and they couldn't outflank you. I could never figure out who were who was involved in that meeting. And I'm now not even sure that meeting ever took place. There's a map done by an amateur cartographer for Washington, very rudimentary of the Brandywine. He only had like three or four forts, and those are on the map, not all the forts. Now I'm wondering now if Washington used that map to set his defense. He gave General Sullivan the, the right flank. And Sullivan did what he was told, but didn't do any more or not much scouting uh, north of there. And on the morning of September 11th, Washington was ready to defend against the British. And take a look at who Lafayette was on that morning. He was a 20 year old, no military ex experience, didn't speak much English. And pretty much, you know, didn't have a command. He, and the other generals weren't real happy for him but for the reason I said it. Here was, you know, a kid that outranked them and he had no experience. So he was not a star by any chance. He was another European general that was on Washington's staff. So if you start the morning of September 11th, he had no notoriety at all. Uh, it, it's kind of, you, get, you got to watch some of the stories that come down and, and repeat at that time. Um, I had somebody tell me as I was uh, doing the research, said, well, you know, after he was wounded, uh, he was put on a wagon and everybody was cheering as Lafayette left the field. Nobody knew who Lafayette was. He didn't go on a wagon, you know. And, and the other story is that he was taken back to the Brandywine State Park and treated under the big tree. Well, he didn't do that either. You know, why would you take him back to where the British Army has control of the treaty? You know, it's just, you know, you've got to watch some of these stories that are around. So in the morning, the September 11th, he's on Washington staff. He's going around in the morning. He's along the Brandywine River. He, you know, he's down by the John Chad's house. Or at least it looks like he was right above it during, during the battle. He, he was all around. He was helping with the orders. He was trying to you know, do whatever he could, as staff officers did. Um, there was another staff officer who became uh, probably with a guy named Hamilton. You've heard that name lately. Or then to Broadway. But uh, Hamilton was there also. And the, as the morning went on, Washington couldn't get clear reports of where the British Army was. He knew parts of it was right up right in front of him, and that was the Knighthausen's force that was under orders to keep Washington there at, at, at the Brandywine. Why, why for Wallace and Howe did the 14 mile flanking movement around the back. And that that's what happened. Washington didn't know. He thought he could be outflanked because he lost the year before at Long Island the same way with out, outflanking. And then word comes verification that indeed Hal had outflanked him and he was up on Osborne Hill lining up his troops to come back. The idea was how Hal would come this way, Knighthausen would come across the, the, the river and they would just crush Washington's army in, in the middle. Like I said, the British, some of the officers said a couple more hours daily, and that would happen. As all this was happening, it looked like it, you know, it was dire times in, in, in our quest for freedom. Lafayette went to Washington and said, I want to go up and help. You know, he volunteered. Washington looked at him and said, we need all the help we can. Get up there and uh, Lafayette and a couple of the states including a guy named it's G I M A T, and I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, Jamet. But the, the, they, you know, hurried up, and they came in back of Conway's troops. Conway's troops, we know, were to the west of the Birmingham Meeting House, across the Birmingham Road. Um, the Brandywine Conservancy has just preserved a large portion. And turning it into a park where you, you can walk around. It's a nice piece of ground there on Battle Hill. Um, Lafayette Road came in back of Conway's troops, joined them, and instead of standing on a you know, 
thing riding on his horse in the background, he jumped off, got in front, and tried to organize a line that was pretty much in disarray. He had the British coming up. He's doing whatever he can. He's trying to organize a bayonet charge, and he gets shot in the leg, left leg, went all the way through his calf. He's kind of lucky he didn't hit anything. He continues for a few minutes, and Jamet sees it and says, what are you doing? Look at the blood. It's coming out of your boot. We've got to get you out of here. Put him on his horse, takes him back to the tree line, which I take it to be the trees and back a Wiley Road, if you, if you know the area up there. By the, that's where the, that uh, military cannon from a later war was. So you can see it at Birmingham and Wiley Road intersection. But he was in the woods back there. He gets treated a little bit enough to get him on the way and as the virginia troops and some of the others are fighting at sandy hollow he starts on the road back to chester he makes it to chester he's standing at a bridge again trying to help out and as the retreating troops come down by him he's putting them together trying to keep some kind of order and finally he's taken into a house down there to be treated uh, doctor comes in, they put him up on the chicken, kitchen table, and as the doctor is getting ready to treat him, some of his fellow officers that knew him came into the house, and his quip was, these guys haven't eaten all day, I hope they don't think I'm dinner. They patched him up enough, they took him into Philadelphia for a day, and then he made his way to Bethlehem. Lafayette was really good at um, making friends and, and people that would help him later. And he actually got a ride to Bethlehem by a future uh, president of the Continental Congress, guy named Florence. So, and that would help him a little bit later in, in the war. He gets to Bethlehem, he spends some week He's recuperating, he's talking about being treating, treated there, and uh, finally makes his way back to Washington's army, probably a little bit earlier than he should have. His wound was still bothering. He's still writing letters back to his wife. And I did the, the first book, I was at Lafayette College, and they had a letter that you know, paraphrased and said, don't worry about me, I've been in this country for months, this is the first time anybody shot at me. I got a little wound. If you have to be wounded, this is a wound you should have. Don't worry about it. You know, that, that type, you know, he'd be really great with his way uh, on the way back yeah, there. So he, he's again treated and he comes back. He joins George Washington. And, and as I said, he was always just a supporter of George Washington. Washington decided to give him a little bit of command experience, see if he could really be. A general. Um, his first foray was just kind of a scouting, two-day scouting outing towards Philadelphia. Um, Washington gave the advice, don't spend two days in one place, move your camp, and the British, you don't want to get surrounded by the British. Uh, of course, he ignored that piece of advice and was almost captured, and this was when Hal was ready to go back to, to England. And he kind of delayed his departure. He said, I'm going to bag Lafayette before, you know, before I go. And they had a lot of the British Army out there. Lafayette was told what was going on. And through some maneuvers and stuff, he made his escape back to Valley Forge and didn't really move to any men at all. And uh, some reports was what a great general he was. And other reports was what a lucky person he was. That kind of escaped, he gave him that first case. Washington started relying on him. You know, he'd become known as this French nobleman and was wounded and his status was getting up. And this took notice of a guy, General Gates, who thought he ought to be the head of the American army and not Washington, along with Conway. And if you heard about the Conway Cabal, they were all together. They said, you know, if we want to get Washington out, we ought to take out Lafayette's influence as soon as we can. The uh, Gates and, and some of those uh, went to Congress and got permission to start the War Board, which 
basically gave orders for Congress for the military operations. And they thought they had a great way to get rid of him. They would invade Canada. Think about invading Canada in that year in the middle of winter. It doesn't sound like a good idea. And Washington knew it, Lafayette knew it, but Lafayette got the orders. Lafayette goes to York, um, gets in writing pretty much all the help they're going to get. He's writing back to the king of uh, France and his father-in-law in hopes that they, they overlook this transgression. And Congress warns like, this is really a bad idea. But this was, you know, Gates' way to discredit Washington, to discredit Lafayette, and make a figure of the army. He gets to the middle of New York, and of course, the promise men, supplies, money is not there. Eventually, it's caught off. Lafayette gets back to Valley Forge, and, and which keeps his honor, and, and Gates is kind of out it, and uh, Conway as being malcontents. As the, um, the war progresses, Lafayette gets a little bit more command. Um, he, he goes to Monmouth Courthouse, plays a you know, role in that battle where Washington uh, probably has one of his most famous victories in, in the three close team even, but Washington held the field, Washington and Lafayette did fine there, and they, they do some more uh, military campaigns through the end of the year. Of course, they don't fight much in the winter. He's sent back to France, and he arrives again, not knowing if he's going to end up in the dungeon. His wife loves him. I mean, the letters that she wrote and about him, you know, so happy to see him. Family was fine. He goes before the king, and the king must punish him. They just can't let somebody you know, go against the rule. And he gave him the severe punishment of home confinement for about two weeks. <laughs> his home is a big monster in a kind of palace with the family and stuff. They, they didn't say if he had to wear a leg bracelet or anything, but he, he had to stay put for a couple of, a couple of weeks. Was left go, and he spent this, the winter thinking up schemes how the French could get involved and, and defeat the British, and you know just lobbying the king and anybody could. We must support America. We must support America. And he kept after it and after it. And that's when um, the next year, early next year, the king decided, yep, we're going to do that. And we're officially going to come in on the side of, of America. And he said, Lafayette, you go back and you tell George Washington we're in it with you. So Lafayette gets ready to go. He goes and uh, says goodbye to the king. And he doesn't wear the French army uniform. He wore the American army, the American army uniform, a, a clear message to the king. Yep, you know, I'm working with them. He gets back, great celebration. The French are on our side. Uh, some of the French Navy and Army landed up in New England, Washington, and Lafayette made a visit to go up to see him. On the way, they stop at West Point and see. Uh, uh, General Arnold and said, we'll be back on our return trip and we'll discuss some more of what we're going to do next. They go up, they come back, they're ready to have lunch with Arnold, and of course Arnold's not there. Arnold planned to turn over West Point to the British, was discovered that morning. Arnold took off within like an hour or so of Washington getting there. Hamilton was there. Hamilton was, you know, just really upset it was Lafayette in Washington. They tried to capture him. They couldn't. He escapes back to New York City with Clinton. And um, it, the rest is kind of kind of history with that. The British sent Arnold to Virginia. And after a while, Washington says, you know, we need to strengthen the South. We're having trouble down there. And I want to get a hold of Arnold. And he said, Lafayette with some troops. They have many. We were a thousand troops, but remember to go down. He said, We'll send Anthony Wayne with more troops soon. You go first. And if you catch Arnold hanging, don't worry about any any trials, any necessary, just hanging on the spot. That's not you know, the ability to do so. You know, they, they were really after him. 
starts and stops for Latvia to get down there. Wayne was having trouble raising the different, you know, different troops. You, you had some mutinies within the Pennsylvania line, New Jersey troops, everything was being bogged down. Uh, he didn't have enough money to pay the recruits to, as a signing bonus. And Wayne was months late getting down to Lafayette. Lafayette was told, whatever you do, don't engage the British Army straight forward. Cornwallis is way too strong. Just keep him in check as much as you can, kind of snipe at him, do this. And that's what Lafayette did. He did that for months. And Cornwallis was chasing him all over. At one point, they were close to uh, Jefferson's home on a cello, and Jefferson just barely escaped. But again, Lafayette was just kind of taking his toll. And with the British supply base so far away in Great Britain, you know, the British needed some supplies, they weren't getting it, so they decided to head back to the coast and the British Navy would come down, pick them up, and take them back to New York City. That was the plan. Lafayette, this whole time, is just pushing them as much as he can. And he's writing to Washington, get down here, we can get them, get the British, you know, the French Navy up. We can end this right here. Wasn't getting a lot of feedback from Washington, but that was Washington's idea too. He had the French army with him making his way down. The French Navy came up from the Indies and in a big battle right before Yorktown drove off the, the British Navy and wouldn't allow them there to rescue uh, Cornwallis's forces. Cornwallis gets trapped. Lafayette and some other French army that was uh, landed with, the, with the, the first French fleet really kind of encircled them. And Washington got there, and we had the siege of Yorktown and the eventual surrender of, of the British, which really paved the way. It was like really major engagement in the American Revolution. We didn't get the Treaty of Power so a couple years later, but we had. Victories. Lafayette again played an important part on all of this. When he goes back to France, he's hailed as a hero. Everybody loves him. He's in politics. The king loves him for his reputation. And then we had the French Revolution. Um, bloody. bloody. And it almost cost Lafayette's wife, and to some of her members, her family was were guillotined. Lafayette almost was guillotined during the French Revolution. The problem was Lafayette loved our style of freedom and wanted France to have the same style. King didn't want that. That would take away his powers. They said, you know, we're not going to, no, no way. And then you had um, you know, the rank and file Frenchman who didn't trust Lafayette because he was a royal and the royals didn't trust him because he was advocating for, for freedom. So he got caught in the middle of it. At one point, he, you know, he had arrest the king and queen and were kind of ordered. And, you know, the French Revolution is just really intricate. So I did, as I said in the beginning of the book, this book is not, you know, a history of the French Revolution or the whole American Revolution. This is about Lafayette, basically America. But I, I kind of went through a little bit where he was uh, forced to kind of go after the king, didn't want to get involved, and was actually arrested while fleeing in Austria, was in prison in, in Austria, prison for several years. His wife was arrested, and as I said, she was put in prison. And um, she, the only reason she probably got out is uh, future president Monroe and his wife were there and helped soothe over some issues to get her out. When she did get out, she went to to Lafayette and her and their children spent some time in that prison with Lafayette and it really destroyed a lot of their health. Their son, George Washington Lafayette, escaped all of this early on, was sent to here to live with George Washington and George Washington Lafayette did spend some time here before going back. Lafayette finally escapes the uh, and was able to come back to France um, with the help of 
Napoleon. He was not a supporter of Napoleon, but Napoleon wanted to use Lafayette Cache to, to help him. So we got Lafayette out. Of course, um, Napoleon and he gets in prison. There's political stuff. Um, by this point, his wife is getting ill. She dies. So his fortune is starting to get back a little bit. He gets elected and then defeated in, in French elections, as did his son. But he was pretty much you know, kind of kind of on the downslide. The uh, we as a country didn't help him much when he was in prison. A lot of it was because we were having our own problems. We weren't like real strong, and we didn't want to go to war with France. So we kind of you know, kind of soft pedaled it, did what we could, but didn't do much. This always bothered Monroe, and Monroe was thinking, you know, we have the 50th anniversary of the founding of this country coming up in a few years, and we need to remind everybody what it took to, to get our freedom. And we really owe something to Lafayette. So the, the uh, Congress agreed for a, um, it was supposed to be at first, a four month visit by Lafayette to honor him and give him some money and land and kind of do what was right by him. The king of France didn't like this idea. He thought Lafayette was coming here to conspire against him. So he, he did not get another great send off. He does come over and this part of the book came from uh, a translation of a document written by Lafayette's secretary who was with him the whole trip. This big, and actually, the president of American Friends Lafayette um, did the translation. Every place he went, from landing in New York City up to Boston, down to Philadelphia, and to DC, big parades, lots of banquets, people just honoring. And it was just amazing. A lot, a lot of speeches, which I didn't put in there, but it was just, you know, he, you, you know, he was the hero being honored. Towards the end of the year, he's in D.C. and he's ready to go back. He says, you can't go. Every state wants you to stop. They want to honor you. So he extends it until August of that year. So uh, to September of that year, he was here 13 months. And he started going you know, around on all these formal occasions. Um, the secretary said the one occasion, one incident that he remembered, was not a formal stop. He was in Norfolk, Virginia, stopped. There was some uh, problem with the carriage or something. There was a little tavern right there. The owner went, you know, welcome Lafayette. Um, Lafayette came over and the owner said, do you have a second to see my son and my wife? And Lafayette said, of course. And the son put his hand you know, on Lafayette's arm and just said, thank you. Thank you for our freedom. Thank you for what you did on camera. Just a really touching moment. And, and that was one of my favorite parts of, of the whole book also. He continues, you know, he goes down to the south, he goes all around. Uh, almost, he had a really interesting, tragic experience almost on the Ohio River. They were out one night coming up and his son was with him, George Washington, Lafayette. He said, you know, that boat captain, and I think something's going on. He's going too fast. It's foggy out there. And sure enough, the boat hits a snag and it starts to sink. And they're trying to scramble to get Lafayette off the boat. He wants to go back because he's given a lot of these great momentums from all those trips. He wants to save him. And son and, and his secretary says, No, we're getting you off. Son said, I'll go back and get the stuff. They get him off. The boat is sinking, and at one point, Lafayette thought his son had died, but he, but he was saved also and made the way back. Nobody did die in the accident, and he continued his trip back across Pennsylvania and New York and Boston and back into Philadelphia. And in the July, the end of July of 1825, he was in Philadelphia. He spent a day out here at Brandywine. He was really sharp. He showed people where things happened. He was went down to the Gilpin house, talked with Gilpin. He, you know, was taken into Westchester 
was given, you know, parade. There was a marker where he was in Westchester now. You want to see it? Uh, big dinner. Um, the A. Dewey Pyle Company. Everybody knows A. Dewey Pyle, right? And the Lada family. A lot of relatives, uh, ancestor gave the invocation to the Presbyterian minister that night for um, for Lafayette. And I, I got what he said, and I got it in the book. And there's a big so American friends would like the celebration the 200th anniversary of this trip, which is coming up. And, and they asked me to kind of help do something here in Westchester. And Chad Ford, me, he was in Chester the night before. And I think a lot of family are going to help us uh, do do something. So if you're looking something to do at the end of July of 18 or 2025, let me know. And I want to see if we can do something else with that. But this was just a grand. Can you imagine anybody today be worthy of 13 months of being in the nation's guest? You know, just being honored the way he was is it, it just amazing. When he sailed back to, to France, he was put on a new worship of America, and the worship was called the Brandy Wine. So he got to go back to France on the Brandy Wine. His later years, he was in and out of, uh, and he was in his 60s when he came here, and he lived for another about 10 years, and he was in and out of politics. He uh, one day caught a cold and fever as he went to a funeral for a friend of his and, and, and died of, of the flu and, and everything that uh, pretty soon after that and is buried in Paris. Um, Big funeral, a lot of people. Um, today, if you go over there, I'm told that you know he's not as revered there as he is here. People call him the hero of two worlds. I think he's the hero of one world, us, and you know a little bit in, in France. Uh, and just you take a look, you know, he, he, you know, he put his life on his line. He spent his fortune. You know, he risked you know his family relations, everything to help us gain our freedom. And you just don't find people like that again. Um, you know, the, the designer said she fell in love with uh, with Lafayette. I've had that comments or variations of that from people who read the book. And you know, he is American hero. That's that was what I did during COVID. I wrote this. So <laughs> that's why you're, you're researching the but, yeah, that's my story. Do you have, do you have any questions here? Um, when did Rochambeau become involved in the American Revolution, and what was his role? He, he was the French general that was at Yorktown, and he came in in, uh, I think it was 80, 1780 was really when he was there and started working with Washington, and there's the Rochambeau trail that they started a couple of years ago to mark where he, he came down to, to Yorktown. But he was the French general. Actually, when France first came under, there was tension where the French soldiers independent were they under Washington's orders, and there was a couple instances where Lafayette was sent to kind of slow it out. But mm -hmm. when Russian Blue was there, the French made it real clear that he commanded French troops, but he took orders from Washington. So that worked out a whole lot better. Yeah. I have a communication question. Yeah. How did the French Navy know to be at Yorktown at that time? Was it coordinated through Washington or Lafayette? Or how did, I, I how think did it was Washington happen? and Russian Blues that uh, to, uh, the message probably through a ship to, to Grassi, the, the admiral there. Uh, when I was in Yorktown, they had a, this year they dedicated, there's now four statues there of the Grassi and Russian Blue. And Lafayette and Washington, which is very interesting. Dave has a question. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm just perplexed about how people um, in that period of time, you mentioned writing a number of letters to his wife. Um, <laughs> did they have postal? Uh, how, how did the letters get back? I, I just. There were only boats. Yeah, no. Uh, what happened was they would he would write the letters, and if he found a Frenchman was going back, 
he would give it to them to deliver. So it was almost like you know, if David went back to France, I give him the letters, and you know he would try to find his way and, and get it. So you know there wasn't a postal system was you know on the boats and who was going to go. So you, you you see what the problem was with that communication. Yeah. Uh, Lafayette was pretty famous for joining anti-slavery societies. Yeah. In fact, there's a I think a British abolitionist said that Lafayette told him, quote, uh, I would, would not have drawn my sword in the cause of American independence if I had known America was going to perpetuate slavery. Is there any evidence that he and Washington communicated during the Constitutional Convention not, about this issue? Not about the issue, but later on. And you're absolutely right about Lafayette being totally anti-slavery and, and that comment. And there's great evidence of letters between him and Washington and him and Jefferson saying, get rid of your slaves. It's not good. Just do it. And actually, I have a chapter in here on slavery. And Washington and Jefferson said, yep, that's what we should do. But then they never did. They always had reasons not to. Right before the French Revolution, um, Lafayette gained control of a couple farms in, in the French Indies. And he didn't send the slaves free, but he gave them education. The idea was to get them to gradually into freedom. He you know, paid for their education, he you know, paid them wages and on the road. When the French Revolution came and he got put in prison, they took over those. Um, farms and enslaved and, and put them back as slaves. But indeed, he you know he was not happy about this at all. Anybody out there in Zoom land? 